Good evening, Papua New Guinea, and welcome to another episode of Business PNG. Following the signing of the Memorandum of Understanding one year ago between the Pacific community and the Papua New Guinean government to mark a new era of closer development cooperation, a team from the Pacific community were recently in the country to discuss three key areas of collaboration. These areas are youth, statistics for development, and geothermal energy. Business PNG spoke exclusively to Mia Ramon, the Regional Director of Melanesia at the Pacific Community, based in Vanuatu, about the organization's work in the country. I'm Mia Ramon, and I'm the Regional Director for Melanesia for the Pacific Community. We're headquartered in New Caledonia. However, we have a regional office in Suva, and we also have a regional presence in Melanesia with a Solomon Island country office, and more recently, a Melanesian presence in Port Vila based out of the Melanesian Spearhead Group. PNG, as you know, is our largest member. We've got 22 Pacific Island countries and territories, so of course PNG is very important to us. So what we are doing with each one of our members is we ask the countries to give us two or three of their real big hitter priorities that are within the sphere of what SBC can do to assist. SBC is not a donor. We are a conduit for government for a lot of funding that comes from donors, but we are the oldest scientific and technical agency in the Pacific, in the region, and really well known by the governments as being able to be an extension for governments, being able to help not only build their capacity, but for some of our smaller members, we supplement or even replace the capacity when countries don't have enough human resources. For PNG, you've got a lot of development going on and a lot of donors in this space and a lot of development agencies but PNG is taking advantage of SBC in a way that hasn't happened for many years which we're really excited about and they've asked us to really concentrate on three areas of development that are critical where SBC has some capacity and expertise. So the first of that is in uh, geothermal energy because as you're aware, there's a very low coverage for the country for national access. I think it's 6% of people are on a grid. So it's really um, an, an effort by the government to try to look at different sources of, it, of renewable energy that can spread to rural areas. So you've got a lot happening with solar and a lot happening with hydro. But geothermal, not so much. So working with the different stakeholders, we are so excited to work with the Department of Energy, the Mineral Resources Authority, um, climate change, all of the different departments across government who have really big stakes in seeing that renewable energy is promoted. So with our geoscience team, we're looking at ways to be able to bring together all the different stakeholders, bring together the ideas, and try to help P&G to develop geothermal energy in a sustainable way to be able to attract the resources, the investors, and SBC in this case is like a catalyst to the government to help to really make this a reality. The second thing that we've been asked to help with is in youth employment. Um, there's a very big youth urban employment that I know the World Bank is helping you with, but what we're looking at is a little different. Um, in the Solomon Islands, there's a fantastic program called Youth at Work that started about three to four years ago. Um, we've been able to employ something like 3,500 youth in urban and rural areas, helping youth to have internships, which is kind of like what you're doing in the urban areas, but especially in the rural areas, teaching kids about climate change adaptation, having kids do climate change ac adaptation activities in their villages, and at the end of their internship of 15 weeks or so that they work doing actual climate change adaptation. Okay. We help them to um, take some business training, a two-week start your own business course, yeah. and then help them to have microfinance in the form of materials to start their own business. So we're looking at sustainable agribusinesses, things that will help to ensure food security, things that will help kids to have their own livelihoods and to contribute to rural economic development because there's no formal jobs out there. In There are in P&G in sectors, but for kids that are really at the grassroots village areas, there's not a lot and kids are, there's a lot of urban drift. So we're looking at solutions to keep kids home and Youth at Work has been noticed by the government and the National Youth Development Authority has asked us to try to replicate that here. 
So we are talking with um, donors now to try to raise some money. We're looking at the hotspot areas that your government has outlined to us through the NYDA, and we're hoping that we can use a, an ad adaptation of the of the concept of youth at work that is most appropriate to PNG. Um, MSG is also highly involved in this, and we have an emerging leaders of emerging youth leaders of Melanesia program with MSG and we've trained some young people from M, uh, from PNG who I think will be very instrumental in helping to start the program here. Well we're just really wanting to emphasize to PNG how much we value being much more visible in this space. I mean we've been around for 67 years or so and we'll be around for 67 more but the Pacific community is very committed to Papua New Guinea. Um, you're a leader for the region in many sectors and we're helping to share your expertise in some fields through MSG in the sub-region so we're very excited about helping to be a conduit to the government to share. You're, you're a leader in ge geothermal so we're hoping that Vanuatu and Solomons can learn while you are going down your road and that will help them with their own development. That's, that's just one of many examples. So we're very excited to be kind of back in a, in a much more visible way for our largest member. And now on to some A team of officials from Fiji's Ministry of Industry, Trade and Tourism and Biosecurity Authority are in Port Moresby this week to meet with their PNG counterparts to iron out issues between both countries regarding oxen palm and other PNG-made commercial products. The meetings will include visits to Paradise Foods in Port Moresby, Hugo Canning on the outskirts of the city, and Chukai Industries in Ley for the visiting delegates to undertake technical assessments. After weeks of back and forth sparking a trade impasse, Fiji and Papua New Guinea have met to resolve the issue of biosecurity pathways and to discuss other trade issues that can facilitate bilateral trade. Early last month, Minister for Trade, Commerce and Industry Richard Maru warned Fiji that PNG would halt Fijian products from entering the market because of unfair trade deals. The trade war between both countries dates back to 2004 when PNG first tried to export oxen palm products to Fiji. However, the Fijian government of the day insisted on protecting its own product while PNG had allowed Fiji's island beef and other Fijian products to flood its markets. To this day, PNG products which include oxen palm, chuka rice and other PNG made products are still not allowed to enter Fiji's market despite requests for an open trade. To convey clearly to my colleague in Fiji and your government, and the PNG government, is extremely keen to, co to conclude the MSG tree. Uh, so we don't want this small impasse to be a, a, a blockage or, or a hindrance to the, the greater step we need to take as a, the MSG sub-regional trading block. The meetings, which will culminate with visits to selected manufacturing facilities like Paradise Food for Biscuits, Hugo Canning for Oxen Palm Corn Beef, and Chukai Industries in Lay for Rice, will serve as an opportunity for the Fijian delegates to witness how the products are made and packaged and to settle their concerns about biosecurity issues. According to Minister Maru, as the two biggest countries party to the Melanesian Spearhead Group, it is better for all involved if this minor issue was settled and both countries came to an understanding. Because we are determined to have more of your trade missions here and we would like to come to the Bula country too and bring our goods and our products over to, uh, to Fiji. And that's why this, uh, this dialogue over the next three days is very important to us as well. And uh, I want to assure you of every support of our government and our team. And uh, we look forward to the, the positive conclusion of your work and the outcomes that we all desire. We want free trade in the islands and in the MSG area. The Independent Consumer and Competition Commission has recently conducted inspections in some of the country's major phone shops. This is in relation to a product recall on the Samsung Galaxy Note 7 by Samsung. ICCC noted that the management of the shops visited were notified by the supplier of the recall. The Samsung Galaxy Note 7 was recalled due to overheating of the battery cell. 
This was related to a manufacturing fault. The overheating of the battery poses a potential fire or burn hazard to its users. In PNG, the ICCC conducted inspections in some of the major phone shops to identify shops selling the phone. The inspection was also to establish whether retailers and suppliers of the product are aware of the product recall and to inquire on the steps taken by retailers to manage the recall and concerns of consumers that may be affected. At the stores visited by ICCC inspectors, it was noted that Samsung formally advised its distributors on the 3rd of September of its decision to voluntarily replace all Galaxy Note 7 products sold to customers. Management of the shops visited have since removed the Galaxy Note 7 off their shelves and have liaised with the supplier for refund and replacement phones. One shop that sold three defective Samsung Galaxy Note 7 phones prior to the product being recalled has offered each of its customers a temporary replacement Samsung J5 smartphone, pending replacement by their supplier. The consumer watchdog has advised the public to report any business houses selling the affected phone using the toll-free number 1803333. Rice company Trukai Industries says it may be forced to lay off its workers if a new rice policy proposed by the government is implemented. Company CEO Greg Worthington Eyre says the allocation of the 80% quota to a company through this new policy will destroy Trukai. Trukai uh, employs over a thousand Papua New Guineans. About 700 of them are based in Lei while the rest are at the other distribution centers around the country. Trukai says these jobs will be at risk. Um, and effectively they would become redundant as a result. The impact will also affect the company's two major shareholders. Trukai CEO believes there will be a price increase as a result of this policy. The impact uh, that uh, further goes on to our, our major shareholders, um, uh, Sunrise and MTSL, the possible price increase is expected to hit the consumers hard. Over the last three years, Chuka has established a partnership with the local rice farmers. This may over time reduce the price of rice. The company has done extensive trials and ever number of projects around the country that are growing several varieties of rice that they have researched for a number of years. They have also developed what they call short growing crops which are confined to a growing season. The work has been carried out in various locations. Um, that uh, Those varieties are uh, good quality and, and would provide a lower cost over time. Um, they would be blended in to the mix for our products uh, and that in itself I think would help uh, mitigate price increases through inflation over, over time. Goodman Fielder International launched a new brand of rice called Scale Rice in Port Moresby last week. Marketing manager Jeremy Fry said the rice will be on sale in GFI outlets in Port Moresby this week. Scale Rice is one of Goodman Fielder's latest product brands apart from its famous Medellin Margarine and Twisties product brands that sponsor television programs in Vocal Fusion, Medellin Moments and FM 100's SMS Blast. The brand Scale is derived in pidgin language synonymous to awesome or cool brand of rice in English. It was introduced in February this year by Goodman Fielder following research and dialogue with 753 consumers throughout the country. Talking to people about what they like about rice, uh, we, we spent some time at the back of Marada, uh, talking to the settlement guys out there about what they like about rice. We did blind tasting, so we had prototypes made. We actually had 10 prototypes made, um, and then we trialled um, all of our rice in blind tasting um, around the country. Like other rice brands such as Jasmine Rice imported from Thailand, scale rice is also imported from Vietnam and packaged in the country. This initiative paves way for large-scale rice farming and processing in the country which benefit local farmers and gates in the agriculture sector. 
The term we'll be looking at um, putting a manufacturing facility in. Um, we've just bought a new block of land in Ley, um, so we're looking to spend about 200 million kina in the country um, on a new factory, which is going to be quite exciting. Um, and we want to include rice as a long-term part of the play with that land. With its potential for economic growth through agriculture sector, Goodman Fielder is pledged to build a facility worth 200,000 kina in Ley Morbe province. This will encourage local farmers to grow their own rice to be sold and processed locally. To rice farming, it's certainly something that we're not going to discount. Um, we're always looking to um, to help out the agriculture sector, and you know, being a diversified food company like us, um, I think it makes sense from a um, you know from a uh, an end-to-end -end point of view um, to get into agriculture as well. It's no secret that the tourism industry in Papua New Guinea has long been a sleeping giant. Compared to Fiji, whose booming industry dominates visitor arrivals into the region, the country has long been plagued with issues hindering the industry's growth, such as law and order and high costs of travel. Despite this, industry stakeholders are determined to change perceptions and capitalize on opportunities presented by the booming Asian markets. This morning at the National Tourism Conference, appropriately held at the newest hotel in Port Moresby, the Stanley Hotel, stakeholders from the Papua New Guinean and Greater South Pacific Tourism Industry discuss tourism for development and the abounding opportunities available. Minister for Tourism, Arts and Culture Tobias Kulang addressed the challenges that the Papua New Guinean industry is facing, stating that because a great part of our vast country is undiscovered, it is also sadly undeveloped, which hinders the growth of the tourism industry. Though the country is described as paradise and an island of gold floating on a sea of oil and gas, the fledgling industry contributes less than 2% to the economy. Law and order issues, high cost of domestic travel and accommodation deter many visitors away from Papua New Guinea and to our neighbors in the South Pacific. PNG remains largely undiscovered and one of the last frontiers on earth. Undiscovered because its products and destinations are largely undeveloped. The industry now contributes less than 2% to PNG's GDP. Well, within the region, on average, it's 10% and upwards. Experts have discovered a growing change of dynamics in the global industry, particularly a growing market in the Asia-Pacific region. In 2015, international tourist arrivals grew by a whopping 4.4%, reaching a record 1.2 billion, and the first quarter of this year saw an above-average growth, with destinations worldwide receiving 348 million international tourists, some 18 million more than the same period last year. Studies indicate that 23% of these visitors were from the Asia-Pacific market. What we do know is that the growth forecast for 2013, and that might sound a long time away, a long period away, but it's not. It's only 15 years away. It's anticipated that this will grow to 1.8 billion tourists worldwide. And what we do know is the largest percentage growth will come from the Asia Pacific region, just up the road here. So we need to be aware of that. We need to be aware of these new opportunities. According to Mr. Flynn, with Asia on Papua New Guinea's doorstep, opportunity is just up the road. The industry is no longer a sleeping giant, but a standing giant that needs to be grown. Deputy Opposition Leader Sam Basil says the government should look into building roads and bridges in economical districts in the country as they contribute to the national government's revenue. Basil's comment follows the recent announcement by the government to upgrade the 89 million Kina East Cape Road in the Milan Bay province. Basil says it is better to put more effort into maintaining roads and other infrastructure like bridges into resource districts. They are generating the much needed tax for the government. Basil says the 110 kilometer Lay Bulolo Road that starts from the Nine Mile Road junction to Bulolo Station is an economic highway. The government is right in, in putting new highways and roads, but isn't it right to? make sure that we put proper infrastructures to uh, resource-rich uh, districts where they are generating the much-needed tax for the government to run this country. Pululo district is home to big corporate companies like Morobe Mining Joint Venture or MMJV, PNG Forest Products and Ginek Chicken who have been paying corporate tax 
since their establishment. Basil made the comments in light of the recent announcement of the sealing of a new road in Milan Bay province. The rehabilitation of the East Cape Road is funded through a World Bank credit of 338 million kina, with additional core financial support from the Australian government. It is part of the World Bank's Road Maintenance and Rehabilitation Project 2 of restoring key national roads across Papua New Guinea. The project will include the sealing of the road and improvements to six existing bridges, as well as the drainage systems. Koilala MP William Sam, who is an engineer by profession, believes the label Lolo Highway will cost an average of 100 million kina. I think 100 million is uh, not a big ask. We need to bite the bullet, put it there. PNG's tourism sector was given international exposure at the Lukin PNG Now Expo. The expo has 40 exhibitors from around the country showcasing their products to international agents, with Solomon Islands as the first international country to participate. PNG Tourism Promotion Authority Chief Executive Officer Jerry Agus says the expo is an opportunity for local tourism operators to exhibit their products without having to travel overseas for international markets. The second day of the expo was an opportunity for the exhibitors to showcase their products to international travel trade agents from various organizations. Uh, most of the time, you know, our industry members are all over the place and once every year we bring them together and that's the time that uh, we also bring our international marketing reps, uh, Tourism Promotion Authority as uh, offices in US, China, Japan, uh, UK, Germany, plus Australia, and uh, we ask our representatives to come to this expo. And when they come, they bring along with them those uh, travel agents and wholesalers that sell Papua New Guinea as the desired tourism uh, destination. The expo is a platform for local tourism operators to showcase and network their products to a wider audience. This is the fourth year of the expo with a bigger number of exhibitors. The expo has 41 exhibitors with 26 international agents who attended today's expo. Up 10 different agents from Australia. Um, so they either come from a fishing background, a diving background or a culture background. Um, so we brought them up here today so they could meet all of the other operators and really get a better understanding of all how everyone works and it's a great way for them to meet everybody in one place. Um, and then tomorrow we'll be taking them out to Rabaul and they'll be out in Rabaul for the next few days experiencing the fishing and the diving and the culture. Quite a big marketing push for the 75th anniversary. Um, Kokoda is very important to Australians. Um, we have such a rich history of Papua New Guineans in regards to Kokoda so it's really important that we get the messaging out there for the 75th anniversary. Um, so we're planning to do quite a big campaign in Australia so we'll be starting that very shortly. Majority of the exhibitors are members of the PNG Tourism Association. The expo is also a lead up to World Tourism Day that will be held tomorrow. It is an initiative by the United Nations World Tourism Organization. The issue's theme is Tourism for All, promoting universal accessibility. And that's all from us tonight. For more business news or if you'd like to view this episode again, visit MTV online at the URL at the bottom of the screen. Or for up-to-the-minute business news and updates, like our page on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at BusinessPNG or on Tumblr. Until next week, have a pleasant evening. I'm Leanne Gerari and this was Business PNG.